You ever just watch something that everyone and their mom has seen at this point and are praising to high heaven for objectively good reasons, and then that thing gets a spin-off or side project that is just way more up your alley in terms of the tone, pacing, characters, writing, and even the music when it decides to have it? Yeah, me neither. Has Been Hotel, the first of many brain children to come out of Vivian Madrano, took the internet by storm in the midst of the heaven storm that was 2020, was the story of Lucifer and Circus Baby's love child wanting to make a hotel to rehabilitate sinners so they can get into heaven. And the thing was so damn popular it broke records all around. Reaching so many views so quickly with its pilot, it was immediately postponed and shipped around from platform to platform until Amazon picked it up four years later. So, in the meantime, she made an inner office comedy starring Brandon Rogers, where three imps and their hellhound secretary kill the living via contracts from the dead so that they can, wait for it, make a living. While not as popular as its older sister series, it gained a sizable audience and has been going for just about as long as has been. But in a twist of fate not seen since The Lion King one and a half, the more lighthearted personal take on the issues the denizens of hell would be going through was more marketable because it had actual things happening in it. From character arcs, to cool fight scenes, to great songs, to LSD trips, to fucking making me emotionally cry for 20 minutes because of how personally this bitch hurts in the good way. Hell of a Boss did something that has been has never been able to do because of its more plot-driven take on storytelling. Give the characters time to breathe. Now granted, there is a fucking war going on in that show, but in Hell of a, because the plot is mainly about two damaged people trying in vain to be better towards each other, and develop a healthy relationship beyond sex, and the titular boss in Hell is so bad at managing his emotions he can't stop being a dick for five seconds, along with the background threat of some angels and humans working together to... I don't know, discover hell or something? At time of writing, this really hasn't gone anywhere. It's mostly been three episodes of establishing the two groups independently, and then a third where they team up for slapstick, and then, oh look, I'm crying. I honestly won't be giving the cherubs or the dudes in Dim much attention because they're not a threat. They're not Adam or even Loot. They're just here so the plot isn't so nakedly obvious as it could have been of a romance. Not to shit on these two groups, but Full Moon felt like they had two ideas for an episode, and instead of just splitting it up into two 11-minute segments, they just made them be as clumsy as possible, because I don't remember anything these five did besides get their asses kicked. The show's real focus, unlike has been, has always been its characters and dynamics, where the former feels more like a plot with characters in it, as opposed to this, where it feels like the characters are having plots come from their actions, because there isn't a fucking ticking clock moving us from each set piece to the next. Like, for real, could we not have just had two seasons to get to know Serpentius, or just develop Angel and Husk separately before making the show hint to them being a couple in, like, episode six or something? I have a lot of thoughts about has -Been, but we're talking about the better show today and why it deserves more attention than it gets, which is already quite a lot. And I think the best way to do this is by looking at and breaking down the characters and their dynamics before season two is even finished. So this won't be immediately outdated in like six weeks or anything, but hey, let's go, I got bills to pay. Links to my Patreon and Discord are in the description. Sign up if you feel so inclined. And what better way to start off this deep dive of emotional complexity and learning to be a functional person than with the show's resident sweethearts, Moxie and Millie. That clip might not be the best way to start this off, but hey, where else are you gonna see a sex death tornado set to an opera outside of like Looney Tunes? Nowhere, that's what I say. Moxie and Millie are the stable couple in the show for a large majority of its run so far. Yes, there is another, but we'll get to them later. What defines Eminem is their ability to talk things out and be a functional couple. They adore one another, but they can still be stubborn and get on each other's nerves. Seen mostly in the pilot, but Unhappy Campers was basically that as the plot. This ability to be the same couple in the room makes it so that the rest of the cast has something to bounce off of. Blitz envies what they have, so constantly tries to stick his dick in it. Luna wants that devotion and comfortability, so constantly makes fun of Moxie his weight even though he's fine, and Ozzy and Fizz mock it to cover their own asses. The two are the definition of goals. They've only been married for a little over a year, but it feels like forever because of the writing. This also comes out of the fact that Millie was added pretty late into production, so that Blitz and Moxie weren't so stuck to each other and that fucking up the plot. This also has made people feel like Millie has a lot less to work with than Moxie, and to a degree, yeah, but I also don't mind that. A lot of people say this show only has two main female characters and they're just supports for the men, but 
but that's not necessarily a bad thing in isolation when, again, it has been the roles are flipped. One has a female dominated cast and the other has a male dominated one. That's fine and good. It's how the women are written that I find to be the important part. Millie, in particular, is seen as a supporting character and nothing else, and therefore badly written because she doesn't have an arc to go through. But when you look at her backstory in life, it's hard to see why she would even need one. Millie was born in the Wrathring of Hell on a farm with a bunch of siblings and two parents scraping by to make ends meet. She had a pretty character-building childhood that's gleamed as early as episode 2, which is incidentally still one of the funniest episodes in the show. Eminem, get in here! We're going to Lulu Land! Lulu Land? Lulu Land? Lulu Land! What defines Millie is her combat skills and love for her husband. The woman literally dove into a mutated fish's mouth to get a drunk moxie, saved him, and then killed the thing for good measure. She's a fucking badass. The only thing the staff could think to do to nerf her was to make her a glass cannon, essentially. Which, for a bruiser, I find to be an interesting combination of traits. You typically want the melee specialist to be more beefy, but here I think it helps balance out Eminem a lot more because of their respective pasts. This line from the Harvest Moon Festival especially makes me think that Millie never lost a fight as a child. The last competition ended in 15 separate funerals. I'm aware, but I only caused nine of them. Couple that with the bouquet line later. I got worse than this during the flower toss at my brother's wedding, but I caught that fucking bouquet and it was fucking worth it. It paints a picture of her as someone who wants to be in a fight and likes it, but given that her surroundings aren't as tough as she is, she never really had a challenge until she started fighting humans who fight just as dirty but also unfairly compared to her friends, neighbors, and siblings. It also speaks to the fact that Millie really just wants to protect Moxie, who, by all accounts, isn't that confident in season one. And even in the episode where he confronts his dad, he's still that scared little kid who had to witness and do terrible things for his father's organization until he met up with Blitz. And that's something I find interesting thing about Moxie. What made him stick around with Blitz wasn't the job or the money you're getting out of greed and going to pride, or even reconnecting with Millie in Wrath. It was the fact that Blitz wanted to get out of prison to get his daughter out of daycare. It was Blitz being a better father than his own that made him want to see where life would take him. And I think that speaks not only volumes to Moxie's need for a real family, but also contradicts while also reinforcing this line from the pilot. We aren't a family, sir. You are the boss. We are the employees. You treat her like she's some troubled teenager. Moxie wants this to be his new family in the same way Blitz does, but where Blitz had time to get away from the actual toxic family he grew up with and has guilt over what happened to his best friend, Moxie doesn't. He just got out of that shit and hated it to begin with. It wasn't the murdering and killing he had a problem with. It was who it was being done to and who was giving the orders that made the difference. Moxie guards his relationship with Millie because Blitz has no sense of normal boundaries and thus that scares him. Millie could give a fuck, she thinks it's fine because of how open and honest her family is. Her sister came out as trans in the hell equivalent of Texas, and no one batted an eye. In the short about Millie and Sally Mae, they talk about being more communicative with one another and want to be better siblings to one another. You don't get that way unless you already have a steady foundation. And I think that says a lot about how she treats Moxie, who needs validation and love and reassurance and all that stuff, because he never got it as a child. He was never told he was loved by his father, and when his mother tried to to soften him up, Crimson got rid of her so that he could make the ideal heir to his empire, and fuck everyone who stood in his way, including Moxie himself. Chaz also plays into this as both he and Millie dated him, but whereas Millie wears her contempt on her sleeve, Moxie is still shy and wants to let it go, because at the end of the day, he still did care about Chaz to a degree, but his betrayal was the final straw that led him to meeting Blitz. I think it says a lot that the only time we see the two of them have a real fight is in Unhappy Campers where Millie gets all the attention and Moxie is shunned to the side and found annoying. Part of me feels like this was a response to fans saying Millie had no real development and Moxie was just another insecure whiny guy, but I kinda get it. I already went through why Moxie is like this. When you're told your whole life you're shit, you're going to act like anytime people aren't kissing your ass is them thinking you're shit. It also isn't helped by the fact that everyone at camp hates him right now and thinks he's annoying on top of the mission shit. 
That's what makes them work though. Even after a fight, Moxie realizes he was wrong to ruin this for her and that he was wrong about the case they were working on. So he lets her have her moments and even gasses her up beforehand. This goes back to what I said last video. Two people who utterly adore each other and are being there for each other even if they have a fight once in a while. It doesn't hurt that literally every time they get the chance the two are three steps from fucking in public. It's honestly great. They love what they do and they love who they do it with. And I think that's what makes them work more than anything, having contrasting skill sets that allows them to cover each other in a fight. Moxie can pick people off from a distance or even up close, and she can thin the herd even more or even cover him while he reloads. It's why I find contrasting class couples to be the best to read and write about. Back in my Overwatch days, the couple I found the most compelling to look into was Reinhardt and Lucio for this exact reason. The two classes complement each other so well, and personalities like theirs work very well in this kind of combat scenario. Just swap out a tank and a support for Genji and Widowmaker. Now that's a cursed ship if I ever did hear one. I wanted to start with these two because the rest of the relationships either stand in comparison or contrast them for better or worse. Be they platonic, transactional, or even romantic, it doesn't matter. We have our standard. Now we see what the show does with it. Try to cut your dad some slack. He may not always get it right, but he's trying. That's more important than you think. Luna and Octavia only have one scene together, and I'm not using them as a relationship, but rather a duo that can be used to show off different upbringings that are affected by the same general stimuli. Luna was abandoned as a pup and raised in a kennel until Blitz found her and adopted her a month before she was going to be put down for not having an owner. The two have a strained relationship to say the least when the series starts, but it's more about keeping walls up so that she won't be hurt anymore. She turned 18 before the series started, so she lashes out to genuine signs of affection. However, throughout the series, we start to see those walls come down a bit at a time. If she lets her guard down too much, she might get hurt or abandoned again. So keeping people at an arm's length is the best way to do it, even if she does like Blitz and the positive attention he brings, going so far as to slip up and call him dad on some occasions. This also explains her coldness to Beelzebub and Vortex. Because she likes Vortex and he's dating someone, it shows that she got her hopes up that a boy would like her, but is currently dating someone else. On top of that, B is the same social awareness and tact as a wasp nest in a tornado, so she can come off kind of flighty and a little bitchy, when in reality she's just trying to help. Being a great party thrower doesn't mean you're a great person. So Luna lashes out about not only how B sees her, but also about her dad, because she wants to be good enough for other hounds to like her. And this is amplified by Vortex dating B, because how could a lowly mutt compare to a deadly sin? And that's not me calling her that, I just understand that mindset of, what makes me so worth a damn when compared to those who are more well off or better than me in something? Imposter Syndrome's a bitch. While Blitz doesn't like her going into the human world, she does have a role to play. I called Millie a glass cannon, but Luna has a lot of potential to be the tank the team needs, or at least a really well done assassin type. Her animal build and the ability to literally bite bitches in half coupled with her strength and speed make her a pretty well-rounded fighter. Add into that her inexplicable ability to have a human disguise, and she could be a damn good femme fatale if her skills were honed more. Octavia, on the other hand, is not as complex in either department but she is an interesting contrast to both Luna and Stolas. Octavia's whole existence was made to be an heir to her father's role in the family, and from what I gather, either Stella told her this or she's figured it out from her grandfather, coupled with the fact that Stella is… well, Stella. It did not leave much in the way of a happy childhood for Octavia to have, so when we first see her, she's this happy little girl with hope in her eyes, but after 13 years of her parents' marriage disintegrating around her, she's just become jaded. All she wants is for her father to love her and be there for her, which, to be fair, he hasn't been, given all of the shenanigans that have happened in his life recently. He is trying, though, and I think that's something that people either don't focus on or only focus on. My thought is this. Yes, he's had a bad life since he was Octavia's age with Stella, and he's going through a sexual awakening and dealing with an unhealthy relationship. However, he still should have been there for Thea more, and I think that paints his actions with a lot more nuance than good dad or bad dad. It's more a flawed person with a lot of growing up to do, which we will get into, don't you worry. I will say, I like that Octavia wants to live up to her father's expectations, even if he isn't being there to help like he should, but also just wants to spend time with him no matter what. This is what I meant when I said that she was a good contrast to Luna. Luna wants to let people in on her terms, 
and fuck everyone else who slightly looks at her wrong. Whereas Octavia wants her dad and maybe a few friends along the way. One rejects the love her father smothers her in, where the other crave the love her father gives someone else who can't comprehend it. The two are interesting on their own, but Octavia hasn't had the screen time to develop much past daddy issues. I really hope they let her and Luna become more like genuine friends. They both could use one, especially one to bitch about their fathers to about their fucked up relationship. Speaking of which... I failed to kill the target at the festival. But don't worry, ma'am. It won't happen again. It better not. I want this cheating prick dead. I don't care who you have to go through, make it happen! Fuck these two. Quite frankly, I don't have much to say about Stella or Stryker, but they are the closest thing the show has to an antagonist, besides Blitz's trauma. I've heard a lot of rumblings saying that Stella is more nuanced than she actually is, or at the very least that she should be, but the problem with that is... Um... No. She shouldn't be. She's a psychopath that treats her daughter like a pawn in the divorce, treats her husband like a walking plague, and full-on tries to strike him for having the nerve to talk back to her. Abusers, especially privileged abusers, are this open about it behind closed doors and do talk shit about their partner to their face and the faces of people who they believe it is safe to do so in front of. Believe me, I should know. There's nothing redeeming about her as a person. There's nothing to do about her aside from killing her and letting Stolas be happy in whatever way that is. He's done some fucked shit, but it's not born out of malice. I don't think Stella even understands the concept of kindness, let alone compassion or self-improvement. Sometimes you can just have a one-dimensional bad guy in your show. It doesn't have to be complicated or fucking sympathetic or even that deep. Rich people suck, and spoiled people with no oversight on their behavior turn out to be awful pieces of shit. What a shocker. When everything is handed to you, you tend to turn out to be a bitch. And Stella is just that to a T. Stryker, on the other hand, hates blue bloods, but works for once so that he can make it big and send a message to the upper crusts that imps aren't here for their needs. Imps are people too and deserve to be treated as such. He's also supposed to be the dark mirror to Blitz in the same way that Stella is to Stolas. All he wants is love and happiness and some good sex, while all she wants is to make people miserable. Blitz wanted to set out on his own life path and make a living where he could be in charge of his own life, as opposed to Stryker who just wants to be respected and doesn't care who gets hurt in the process. Yes, they do both kill, but Blitz only kills people who he's asked to do so, and it's so the one in hell can get revenge on the people who are still living, and even the score. Making things fair, which is something that Blitz really cares about. Stryker could give a fuck about who's dying so long as he gets respect, which he is routinely denied after his initial introduction, and no one wants to fuck him anymore. He actually gets annoyed that people are so horned up in this show. It makes him feel like he's in a different show entirely, like whoever wants to write for him is making the joke that he's trying to make this a dramedy rather than an action comedy. He's got a sexy voice, he's got that rattlesnake tail gimmick going on, and he's got to deal with Carmilla Carmine for some white tinted guns so that he can kill people. He's still an asshole to the characters I like, so I'm just not a fan of his in general. That being said, there is something for how you can mitigate that in some instances. Come on, big daddy. <laughs> well, you know I can't say no to a face that cute. Mm hmm That's why I use it. Just try to stay out of trouble, Fizzy Frog. Fizz and Ozzy are two characters the fan base seemed to latch onto rather quickly. For me, it took a bit longer. In their debut episode, they're condescending, rude, and unpleasant to pretty much everyone in the cast for one reason or another. And that's fine, I get having asshole characters, especially when they're trying to cover their asses and deflect their relationship from any prying eyes. Given that Osmodius is the embodiment of lust, it would make sense that him being in a committed, presumably monogamous, relationship is something that he would want to avoid getting out so as not to be seen as even less than he already is for being the weakest of the sins. Fizz doesn't want this either so that he can keep his boss Mem unhappy and not jeopardize his job or standing as a sex symbol. Their relationship is big cute, and I really don't have issues with them as characters, and that's because they were meant to be redeemed by the narrative from the moment they appeared. It's the difference between authority intent and fandom brain wanting things to be more nuanced than it really is, like with Stella. It's no wonder these two got two back-to-back -back episodes with their respective counterparts to A, clear the air on what actually happened way back when, but also B, make it clear how royalty and sins can compare with one another, and that it's okay to let someone in, even if they are higher up than you. 
Fizz is Blitz's oldest friend from the circus, but where Blitz sucked at being a performer, to the point he couldn't make a balloon animal correctly, Fizz was a natural at everything. After the cake exploding accident is explained, and it's told to both of them that the other one did care, and it was everyone else who pushed them away, they more or less bury the hatchet. They become friends who want to be there for one another and be there in the best way they can. Ozzy plays into this as well, because he was willing to give up everything for Fizz, and even denied royalty request for the sake of his boyfriend. Oz doesn't get a lot of screen time, and much like Millie, plays support to Fizz, which is fine. It doesn't need to be any deeper than that. Fizz has a lot of trauma and things to deal with, whereas Oz has more financial and business-related things on his mind. Their big contribution to the series is their contrast to Stolas and Blitz, because Fizz was adored and loved and wanted as a child, while Blitz wasn't. So that manifested in tentative trust while Mammon played on his ego for profit. Oz couldn't give a fuck what Fizz does with his time, so long as he's happy and safe. And that's kind of the brilliance of their relationship. Not to mention, they take the one big, one small extreme the other two have to a more comical degree, which I'm always a fan of. Speaking of designs, the Sins really have stellar ones. Every character is well designed, but the Sins embody their traits a lot differently than you would think. Instead of being literal like most interpretations, the various Sins are more personality or vibes based. For example, which of these two looks like the Sin of Gluttony? Yeah, that's what I thought. But in this series, it's more about getting the sin done rather than just copying a design template. And I particularly like how Beelzebub is a skinny wolf girl who just does everything to excess, and Mammon is an obese capitalist. Whoops, tautology! Showing that greed is not sexy, but indulgence can be if you manage it right, which B can. Most of the time. Osmodius takes this one step further. He's a dude with three heads like Cerberus has a chest you could land a fucking plane on, a waistline just like a rabbit would be jealous of, heels so pointy that you could kill someone with them, and tail feathers like he's a rooster. Like, this dude lives up to the idea of being the living embodiment of lust because he checks off so many disparate boxes that it just somehow works. And you can feel the love and lust he and Fizz have for one another, and while they were afraid to show it, they now have the confidence to go out and be who they truly want to be with each other. Which leads us to the real stars of the show. Oh shit, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit. And I, I, I can't do this, no, not again. I, I haven't performed since- Blitz, if your performance on stage is half as good as it is in bed, you'll leave them breathless. Now hurry up and wow them so we can get back to finding Via. Break a leg, darling! You can deny it all you want. You can say that we don't need romance and everything, you can say this ship is toxic and that it needs to end, and you can say that this takes away from the real plot. But you know what? You're wrong! You're just wrong. People say that Hell of a Boss has no real plot because the episodes are more character beats or introducing new characters into the mix to make it more overbloated. And it's funny that they say this when the series isn't even half over and this criticism was levied at the show in season one. Like, it wasn't even done picking a plot line yet and people got mad about it when from the pilot, it's been about Blitz dealing with his issues and letting Stolas in. That's it, that's the show. It's these two fuckers dancing around the issues they have until they either split up or work together to be together. I said this earlier, but you can like the cherubs or the dorks in Detroit, but they aren't what make the show interesting. They aren't the plot. They're the B plot at best, C at worst. But for my money, the striker subplot is much more the B story, with these five schmuckos being time killers that tie into the Earth and Angelic realm respectively. In all honesty, I'm fine with these things if they're gonna do anything with them, but it seems like they're just here to kill time. Like in Full Moon before the real episode ends, they just keep splicing in stuff with these five, and I hate it. It feels like you could cut this episode into two 11 minute segments and have stronger stories overall. I want to care about them, but I don't, and interspersing them between the thing I came here for is only going to irritate people more. Anyway, before we get into the scene, we need to talk about how we got here. Stolas and Blitz met the night of his and Stella's anniversary party. Blitz blitz all over his back and Stolas is Stolas' book to access the living world so that he could do his job. From there, the two enter a sexual contract in the first episode that allows them to get what they both want. Good dick and some blood drainage. And from that point on, I'm not gonna lie, you can tell the series did know what it wanted to do with them. They knew they wanted to do their will they won't they shtick, but otherwise it was more a matter of how they were going to unpack their respective shit to get them together. And for a majority of season one, it seemed to be going well. It made sense on how and who and why they did things, and in season two, that continued, with episode one being an episode I really liked, but the rest of the fan base 
didn't, but we'll swing back to that one later. And from episode two onward, they seemed to be getting better and started to let down some of those walls and care for each other in different ways than before. It's kind of hard to see, but I talked about their damages as we went through this, and Blitz's inability to deal with raw, earnest emotions and Stroll is craving it is kind of the make or break thing of the show. Blitz wants to be wanted. He wants to be seen and heard and respected to the point he changed his name to no longer have a clown sounding O, and the only characters who respect him enough not to say it are his employees, his daughter, and Stolis. Even Fizz says it at the start of Oops, but then stops shortly thereafter. Stolis has so much and can give him so many things, but the issue is that Blitz wants to have it and say it. He wants to say that he deserves nice things and deserves to be loved, and that's kind of his arc in a nutshell. While the two have to be more willing to be open to one another, Blitz, more so than Stolas, has to realize that he's not beyond love or even being wanted. I think the episode that shows this the most is Western Energy right at the end when he sees that Stolas can be hurt. He actually gets choked up and is concerned, whereas before he didn't really care if he was in danger because nothing Hellborn can hurt royalty except the gun that Stryker left behind. It even comes back on itself when you think about Truth Seekers because Stolas is concerned about him getting hurt, but only in so much that he thinks he's not being careful enough. They know the other has some immunity to their respective antagonists, but it still adds a bit of detachment to the whole thing that the other isn't fully aware of. Another thing that separates season one from two is just how Stolas talks to and about Blitz, going so far as to call him Blitzy and treat him like a child and pinch his cheeks. Like, it's really condescending when you get down to it, and it's kind of what leads into Full Moon. Being treated like a toy you're played with to then suddenly being wanted very earnestly isn't going to be met with a genuine reaction. And that's kind of the beauty of that episode when you think about it. This is 100% both of their faults, but it's also mainly Stolas's because he made it very clear from the beginning this was mostly a sex thing, and then he caught feelings and escalated it when Blitz wasn't ready. Now, to be fair, Blitz has been ignoring these signs since Aussies, but that's also where they began, too. So this going from fucking for a job to genuine love in the matter of weeks or months makes it a little hard for a man who accidentally blew up his childhood brother and accidentally kill his mother in the same incident to then be left alone for 15 years to comprehend and accept in the blink of an eye. Another thing that doesn't help the Full Moon episode is that this decision to use the crystal as a way to break the deal is just kind of sprung on the audience, unless you watch the music video for the show canon version of Look My Way, a remake of a fan song that just explains this line of thinking. It's a fantastic number and it's super well animated, do not get me wrong, but my point is that in the almost year-long wait between the episode where the crystal is brought up, and the full moon with two episodes and the main series this thing spawned off from releasing, it might have been nice to be reminded in our conversation with Octavia before she goes to her mother's or something. Even a call to Ozzy thanking him for changing his mind would have been enough. I'm not bashing the decision or even this part of the episode. My point is that it threw me for a loop the first time I saw this, and to be honest, Blitz's reaction was pretty standard for him. While it hurt, I... We need to back up. We'll get to this in a second, but I want to talk about Season 2's pilot first. So, this episode is a flashback to Stolas' 10th birthday, when he was given his job to be the Watcher of the Cosmos and was engaged to Stella. As a birthday present, his father took him to the circus to get him to stop crying, and that's where he first saw Blitz and fell in love. So his father bought him for five bucks. Seriously, fuck this man. Fuck all the dads in this show, honestly. Someone's working through some issues with this series. The rest of the day is the two of them bonding while Blitz steals the ever-loving shit out of the Goetia family stuff, until we cut to the night of the anniversary party, and we get what is probably one of my favorite scenes in the show. It's the events of the night before the pilot, and it shows how bad at reading people Stolas is, how wrapped up in his fantasies and his frank naivete on how people operate, or should be told to do things. Remember when I said he was in an abusive marriage that he's technically been in since he was 10? Well, that kind of applies to this scene. He's never had someone he wanted who wanted him back. He's never had consensual kinky sex with a man, let alone the man who gave him the best birthday he's ever had and who he's been dreaming about since that day. The music even goes along with this and has this almost comedic irony with the way it doesn't match the actions being done, but Stolas's emotions. It is his episode after all. Makes complete sense to me. And this is their first real interaction as adults, and it's what kicked off their relationship and partnership with the book. A lot of people were pissy at A, a backstory puppy love thing thrown in to retcon their dynamic, which I honestly loved. It makes this tragedy even more of a tragedy when you realize it's been in the back of Stolas' mind for nearly two decades. And B, that Stolas doesn't understand what's going on in this situation. 
Stolis, a man in his mid-twenties who's been assaulted, berated, belittled, bossed around, shoved around, and treated like shit, and was never given the proper social tools to learn how to be a person, much less understand what the word consent means on his end. That's the guy you're holding accountable for understanding that he's being used in this scene. This is what I mean when I talk about people not getting stuff, because the second a character doesn't do something logical, people stop thinking about which character is doing the thing, and just say that he should have known better and stop there, regardless of the context. Skolas' whole thing is that he doesn't think about the implications of things. He kind of just goes for it and doesn't ruminate on it. It's not till Ozzy's that that changes at all, and even in the full moon conversation, he doesn't let Blitz have a moment to think. He just bails. This one conversation is so visceral in its execution because I've been both of these bastards at different points in my life, and neither of them is fun. Neither of them is in a good place to be in, and even in the moment your heart is racing, your brain is isn't thinking clearly, and frankly, while I hate Blitz's response, I wouldn't change a thing. It's so real, and it's been building for such a long time, and while the words are completely wrong, the emotion and feeling behind them are 100% justified. Because he has been treated like he's small, like he doesn't matter, like he's just something to play with, and even though Stolas talks about him in reverent tones now, that wasn't always the case. In Season 1, it's very obvious this is a game to him, or something to have fun with because it's not real, because it's sexy, and that worked until he caught feelings and decided to change the rules without talking about it. This scene is what caused this whole video, and I can't really put it into words other than it's great. It's phenomenal and it shows why they shouldn't be together right now. There's growing to be done on both sides, and Stolas has grown a bit, but Blitz needs time to understand that he's kind of been a jackass lately, and that needs to change. My favorite line for just how much he's not actually as detached from this as he likes to think he is, is this one. I don't understand. Why are you giving me this? Am I not, like, fucking you good enough? Because I, I can always, I can always do better. Fuck, I relate to that so hard. I honestly want to go really in depth about this entire last five minutes, but I realize when a video is going on a bit too long said the man with the 7 hour ranking video, but still! So if you guys want, I'll do a follow up that's just dedicated to this conversation. But anyway, Apology Tour does that a lot actually, where he starts off after the breakup being very bitchy, but as the night goes on he starts to realize that he was wrong and wants to fix things, and the way he thinks he can do that is by leaving Stolas alone. And a lot of people would say, well now that you can't have him, you want him, but that's not it, it's the fact that this one line, I think so very highly of you. I didn't realize you think so low of me. Is met with a slam door and no context, and Blitz is doing what he always does, which is lash out. Only after another earnest conversation with not only Stolis, but Barossica, god damn I cannot get away from this franchise, does he realize that he was wrong and they both need space. And that's a powerful thing, because letting your thoughts cool on both sides of the divide can let a lot of things come to light in a way that you wouldn't have considered. I myself have had those moments recently where I needed space, and I and the other person came back better and less fresh from the thing we were talking about, and whatever issue there was has been, if not forgotten, at least put to rest. I've even done this with Red, it's just sometimes taking a break is important for everyone involved. This episode I think is just as important as Full Moon because it's Blitz realizing how bad of a person he's been to everyone he ever cared about because of his baggage and having to confront it. He lets Stolas have a good time, and it hurts, but it's good so that he can work on himself in the future. The song Stolas sings is the thing that sends him overboard, since he wasn't sure how he felt until he saw the actual earnestness Stolas had for him, and how much the breakup is hurting him. It hurts even more when you remember that Blitz was trying to text him all day, and kept erasing them for fear of making things worse, and the subsequent conversation on the couch was going somewhere, until the succubus decided to jump in so the episode could end, but I also think that's good. It makes it so that this is put to rest for later, but it's not down and out, especially with his reaction to that kiss. Letting Stolas and himself calm down and try to reconnect later is probably where the season's heading, and I think that's smart, because at the end of the day, when all you have is emotional rawness, then you're just gonna come out of something emotionally hurt. Hell of a Boss is a great show. It's not perfect, it's not flawless, and it's changed tones more times than I can count. But what it does have is heart spewed across the wall. It didn't occur to me until I was talking with a bunch of friends, but the message of the series might just be you are worth loving despite your trauma. 
that no matter what, you are worthy of being loved and loving in return. Everyone in the show demonstrates that as a central through line. Eminem with how Millie takes care of Moxie and his needs, Luna and Octavia dealing with their dad's shit, Fizzy and Ozzy learning to deal with his disabilities and anxiety, and the big two learning that they deserve to be happy, even if it's scary. Or even a little cliche. But it's what makes life worth living and worth sharing. You're allowed to want that or not want that, and if you're Ace or Arrow, more power to you. But speaking as a polyamorous, allosexual gay man, I can say without a shadow of a doubt, love is the thing that keeps me going, both emotionally and physically. It's important to me, and this show gets it right a lot of the time. Even when it shows bad characters messing up, it at least shows you that even when you do mess up, you can and should do better, and you should feel bad for messing up. But that doesn't preclude you from love. And it's that emotional vulnerability, that honesty, that rawness, that I think makes this better than its sister series. Because while that show has a lot of good moments and characters, it's missing something by nature of its pacing. And that's its heart. Has been has passion, by Satan does it have a lot of passion. And I will devote time to it one day, but it never made me cry. It never made me sit up and think about the ways in which its characters are better the more you think about them. Its music, while catchier than Hell of a, never made me re-examine my own relationships or past actions or any of that. It simply was. And then I listened to the soundtrack, got more pissed off the fanbase was obsessed with Twee and Law over here, instead of this absolute ball of adorableness, and moved on with my day. But this series kept a hold of my leg, and would not let go for anything. I hope this series keeps going until it actually ends properly, and get more of a fan base like its sibling did, because it's a happy day in hell when I see a new episode pop up. My name is Chris. If you like this, feel free to like, comment, subscribe, and do all those fun things. I've also got that Discord and Patreon I breezed past earlier if you want to talk more directly or support me monetarily. And I hope you have a hell of a fractastic day.